It's time for overtime. And I know just the guy to talk to. In the world of sport, it's all about the playmakers in today's headlines, from locals to the pros, with interviews from local standouts and sports all-stars across the country that will have you talking. Tell me more, tell me more. Hear from coaches to players, sports analysts, and broadcasters who are a part of the action every day. Overtime, now with Burt Ramin on ESPN 102.3 AM 1000 KSOO, Sioux Falls Sports Leader. Welcome back. It is the Monday edition of Overtime. It's hour number two. A little bit of a late start, but for good reason. A couple great guests in hour number one. Mark Velick, the executive director of Huther Family Matchpoint, hopped on the show with us to talk about the upcoming Market Beat Open. Tickets for that big marquee tennis event here. Pro tennis on the men's side in Sioux Falls, October 20th through the 27th. Tickets go on sale on August The 26th, more information, details, format, everything you need to know, marketbeatopen.com. We also just finished up a lengthy chat on those Chicago Bears, a team that I think's in tune for seven, eight, maybe nine wins this year. Robert Smith of the Bears blog just wrapped up with us moments ago. You can find him and the blog at the Bears blog on Twitter. Still to come today in the show, headlines and highlights on this day in sports history, latest from the NFL including potential landing spots for former Viking running back Dalvin Cook. We'll break down the FCS preseason top 25 and more and send you packing with the good, the bad, and the ugly on your Monday. NHL finals from over the weekend. Friday night, two series came to a close. Florida Panthers move on, winning the series in Boston. Two to one, the final on Friday night's game. They win the series four games to two. It took double overtime, but Dallas gets the job done in Denver on the road Friday night with a 2-1 double OT win as Dallas takes that series four games to two. Continuing series between a couple teams north of the border, Vancouver and Edmonton. Look back on Saturday, the Oilers won 5-1 in game six to push it to seven games. And tonight, game seven, eight o'clock puck drop on ESPN. Oilers at Canucks stand alone for a marquee game seven from the NHL. Saturday in the NBA, OKC dropped and lost the, the final game of the season, falling in the series to Dallas four games to two close game Luka Doncic and the Mavs just an inch better than the OKC Thunder 117-116 Doncic another triple double Dallas wins moves on to the Western Conference Finals with a 4-2 series win yesterday couple teams that many people had buried following game five into game six rightfully so Neither of them looked prime to make a run or win their respective series. But we saw Indiana face off with the New York Knicks. And this one wasn't close yesterday. Halliburton backs up, shoots a triple and connects. And the lead is 18 for Indiana with three and a half left in the third. Final seconds tick away and there's the horn. It took seven games, but the road team has finally won the Indiana Pacers advancing to the Eastern Conference Finals for the first time in a decade, and they'll head straight to Boston to face the Celtics beginning Tuesday night. Absolutely surprising, but the Indiana Pacers, one of the top defensive teams in the Eastern Conference, they've been working on getting that side of the ball so much better throughout the year, and according to head coach Rick Carlisle, that's the difference for the Pacers that has led them to the finals in the Eastern Conference. You know, this team was very, very much maligned for its defense early in the year. And they have flipped the script. I mean, they they won this series with grit and guts and physical play, you know, pressing 94 feet. And that's how we beat Milwaukee, too. Carlisle says grit, guts, and physical play. Part of the difference for his team. That was certainly on display for the Minnesota Timberwolves last night. Historic come from behind victory. They trailed by 20 Not in the first quarter, not in the second quarter, but the early portions of quarter number three in Denver, game seven. All signs are pointing toward the Nuggets doing the expected punching and winning against the Timberwolves. But Minnesota comes all the way back and puts the finishing touches on a comeback with a big-time three from Anthony Edwards. Conley picks the pocket of Jamal Murray. Conley feeds it to Nas. Down the lane. Extra pass to the corner. He accepts himself. Fires the three. He hits it! 
Ten-point lead late in the ball game. Minnesota, a dominant third, dominant fourth quarter to finish the job. 98-90 to the final. If you're looking for the stat leader, Carl Anthony Towns, 23 points and 12 rebounds. But Kat says it's our big 15, not our big three, that makes us the team we are. We don't have a big three. We got a big 15. You know, we, we, every single person on this team means a lot to this team, and they help in so many different ways. Uh, this game just shows that the Timberwolves, not Anthony Edwards, not Carl Anthony Towns, not Rudy Gobert, the Timberwolves are a special team. The excuses tend to roll in this time after every single series. Not a whole lot out there, and to his credit, Michael Malone says, hey, the better team did win. But here's what he had to say about one of the reasons why his team unceremoniously exited early with the title defense on the line. Those that know me, I'm, I'm not an excuse maker. The better team won, so I'm taking nothing away from Minnesota. But when you look at the fact that all the teams that are still playing, we played into June last year. A lot of basketball. And then uh, we had to play our guys, our main guys, unlike last season, through game 82 to secure the number two seed. Whereas last year, we, we were able to rest down the stretch. And I think the the run last season and coming back and you know the, the amount of minutes that our, our starters had to play, I think mentally, emotionally, physically, I think guys are gassed. They're dead tired. They gave me everything I could ever ask for. Denver will not repeat as NBA champions this year. One of the favorites throughout the season. At times, the favorite is knocked out ahead of the Western Conference Finals. It is Dallas and Minnesota, just like nobody thought it would be a week ago, two weeks ago, a month ago. Dallas and Minnesota Western Conference Finals on tap. Game one is coming up on a Wednesday from Minnesota, 7.30 on TNT. Game one in the Eastern Conference Finals, Pacers at Celtics, 7 o'clock on ESPN. When it comes to the four teams remaining, Jay Williams had this to say about who he thinks is the favorite. Their defense, when it kicked into gear, the thing you never question about Minnesota is their defense. It's finding their offensive rhythm. So when their offensive rhythm came into play, that second half turned into a different game. I Look, this is the Minnesota team I'm going to pick to win the whole thing. Like, and I know Boston's there. I know they have to go to Dallas. I know Dallas is your squad. I love watching the way they play. Just defensively, who they are, the way they answer the bell, the way they – Jamal Murray got strapped up, too, in the second half. Ooh, did. Held the 10 points in the second half, coming off 24 points in the first. That's ESPN's Jay Williams, and I will say this. I was down on Minnesota. I thought Denver would cruise and win the series following uh, the 2-2 tie in the series, the 3-2 lead in the series. I thought Denver was going to go ahead and move on. So I'm not saying that I got that right, but if we look back when we redrafted things after the 2-0 lead for Minnesota over Denver, I said Minnesota over Boston, and now with things back into focus and all the weird things that unfolded over the last week in the NBA come from behind, the slaughters in certain games, everything in between, I still like that pick, Minnesota over Boston. Boston just doesn't feel right. I still think they're a championship team. They've got the pieces. They got the puzzle. Too reliant on the uh, the three ball for me, and if Minnesota gets there, and I'm not going ahead and putting them past Dallas, that's a big challenge with Luka and Kyrie and company, but if Minnesota gets there, I don't know how you could pick against Minnesota this year with what they've done, their defense, ball control, lockdown, whatever it might be, physicality, the togetherness, the Big 15, as Kat put it, has been very, very fun to watch this year for the Minnesota Timberwolves. Now, continuing with your scorecard, Major League Baseball Finals, Cubs are in a tough spot. They lost to Pittsburgh yesterday again, 3-2 the final from Wrigley, Chicago 26-22. and Other finals, Boston beat up on St. Louis in St. Louis 11-3. White Sox lose game number 33 of the season as the Yankees once again take it deep. Now flex it with the 0-2 pitch. Swing and a fly ball. Hit deep to right field. Turning and watching near the wall is Jimenez and it is gone off the top of the wall. Right onto the porch and it's a two-run homer for Aaron Judge. 7-2 the win for the Yankees. New record for the White Sox 14-33. and That audio courtesy of WFAN. Minnesota Timberwolves, excuse me, Minnesota Twins have now lost six straight ball games and the worst part is it came at the hands of a division rival. A swing and a drive! High, deep to right! This ball goes! And a walk-off! Three-run home run for Will Brennan! 
That part of a 5-2 win for the Cleveland Guardians over the Twins. 5-2, 30-17, the new record for Cleveland. 24-22 and for Minnesota. Six straight losses, back-to-back sweeps. Minnesota right back in action today. Tell you about that in a moment. Other finals, Milwaukee lost in Houston 9-4. Kansas City pours it on Oakland. Lopsided affair out uh, in Kansas City. 8-4 the final. Here's the pitch. Breaking ball hit, pulled on the ground. Fair up the first baseline and rolling toward the right field corner. For means in to score. Renfro rounds third. He crosses standing. Massey gets waved around. Relay to the plate lane. Massey slides in safely. Pasquantino gets all the way to third. The base is clearing triple. Audio there courtesy of KCSP. Other finals, Rockies lost to the Giants 4-1 on the road, and Detroit lost in Arizona 6-4 yesterday. Today and tonight in Major League Baseball, White Sox at Blue Jays get it going at 2.05. You can watch that one on ESPN+. Plus. Other matchups, Mets at Guardians, Brewers at Marlins, Tigers at Royals, and the Cardinals home to the Orioles. Minnesota Twins right back in action. They're in D.C. matching up with the Nationals game one of that series. 5 o'clock pregame coverage, 5.45 the official start time. You can listen to Twins baseball all season long right here on ESPN Sioux Falls. WNBA tonight in action. The Indiana Fever still looking for their first win of the season. They are 0-3, playing host to Connecticut tonight, 6 o'clock jump time on ESPN. And over the weekend, NASCAR raced at their all-star race at North Wilkesboro Speedway in North Carolina. Joey Logano took the checkered flag. Next up for NASCAR, they race it Sunday at Charlotte. 5 o'clock start time. You can watch it on Fox and the PGA Tour PGA Championship from Valhalla certainly full of drama this year but the guy who rifled out of the gate was Xander Shoffley and the guy that won his first career major yesterday Xander Shoffley I just kept telling myself I need to earn this uh, earn this and and be in be in the moment and I was able to do that Absolutely true. 21 under par for Shoffley, besting Bryson DeChambeau, who was second. Fantastic weekend for him. 20 under par. UFL action returns Saturday and Sunday on the scorecard. Saturday's opener, Battle Hawks, who recently clinched a playoff berth at the Renegades, 11 o'clock on ABC. Into your Reliabank headlines of the day for hour number two. Seven-seeded Augustana fell on Sunday afternoon to two-seed UT Tyler by the score of 2-1 to one in extras. The Vikings opened up the scoring, but UT Tyler ended up answering back and scored the winning run in extras. Augie will play its next game in a double elimination tournament beginning on Tuesday. The Vikings collected six hits, one run, and left three runners on base. Again, the opponent to be determined. But for the Augustana Vikings softball team, they'll play its next game tomorrow at 1230 Central. They'll face the loser of Western Washington and Wilmington. If the Vikings win, they'll play again Tuesday at 5.30 and look to prolong their season. And they'll face the loser coming out of the winner's bracket in that contest. So Augie now backs against the wall. They're not eliminated. They got a win from here on out to move on into uh, the next game. 12.30 tomorrow, game one. If they win, tomorrow at 5.30 will be game two in that postseason journey for Augustana softball. Speaking of Augustana, the NSIC champion Augustana baseball team did conclude their season over the weekend saw it come to a close Saturday against second seed Central Missouri in the NCAA Central Region Pod 1 final. The Mules won 13-2 to capture a spot in the Super Regional and Augie concludes a very historic season with a 47-10 record. That's the second best win percentage in program history. Tied the second most wins in program history. Also set uh, high marks for an 18-game win streak in the season. Won their fourth NSIC regular season title and fourth NSIC tournament title and again rewrote the record book in numerous categories this year. We'll be talking with head coach Tim Huber later on this week on overtime to conclude a very fun and historic season for Augie baseball 47 and 10 the final mark full recap of that game go Augie.com veteran Jay Jackson was designated for assignment by the Minnesota Twins yesterday as the club recalled fellow right-hander Caleb Bushley from AAA St. Paul Jackson has struggled recently 685 ERA and 17 relief appearances this season 36 year old has six seasons of major league experience with six different teams going seven and four over his career with a four one nine 
1.9 ERA in 101 appearances. Jay Jackson designated for assignment. The latest news there from the Minnesota Twins. More on Minnesota Pro Sports, and they deserve it. All the talk we're giving the Timberwolves today, their historic 20-point comeback win over the Nuggets in Sunday's Game 7 to earn a trip to the Western Conference Finals actually started 13 months ago at a bar a few miles away from Ball Arena. The Timberwolves had just lost to the Nuggets in the first round of the playoffs last April with Anthony Edwards' potential game-tying three coming up empty as time expired in Game 5. Afterwards, Edwards had a couple teammates and they went to a cocktail lounge, forget me not, in the Cherry Creek neighborhood with their chartered flight back home, not scheduled to leave until the next morning. Of all the gin joints in all the towns of the world, Denver point guard Jamal Murray, fresh off a 35-point showing in a closeout game, just so happened to walk into the same bar as the Timberwolves that night. And Edwards, budding star, yet to have a breakout season, breakout postseason, that had turned him into a bona fide superstar this spring, had a message to deliver to Jamal Murray. Edwards told ESPN that he was talking bleep. He was telling Mike Conley, I'm sick of you. You can't guard me. I told him, we'll be back. You'll see us again when we're fully loaded. How about that for some premonition? How about that for a prediction and a challenge uh, for the Minnesota Timberwolves? The season they put together, the top seed in the West, more often than not throughout the year. They let that slip from their grasp late, but still one of, if not the best team in the Western Conference year in, day in, day out throughout the season season Minnesota has proven it defensive again and again and again and the depth is so good for Minnesota it is ungodly how good they are how deep they are right now as you heard Carl Anthony Towns moments ago it's our big 15 the number of players that come off the bench and make a contribution for Minnesota has been the difference this year Anthony Edwards is the best player on the team absolutely true but there are five, six, seven, eight guys every single night that people are saying, how do they have all these guys? It's not fair, Minnesota. One of the deepest teams and the best defensive team remaining in the postseason. There was huge anticipation for Sunday to produce a historic MSG game yesterday for New York sports fans. It absolutely did but just not the one that the New Yorkers could have expected. And probably and unexpectedly, according to ESPN.com, in a road game seven situation, the Indiana Pacers had one of the greatest shooting halves in the 77-year history of the league. When the stunned New York Knicks tried to recover with a second-half push, the Pacers superstar and their super sub stepped in and delivered the final blows. The result was a 130-109 to crushing victory for the Indiana Pacers, eliminating the Knicks by finishing off four victories in five games. After falling behind 2-0 in the series, the Pacers will head to Boston to open up the Eastern Conference Finals against the Celtics on Tuesday. Head coach Rick Carlisle said after the Pacers completed their second consecutive series, Series win over a higher seed. Well, we're the uninvited guests. Here we are. When you win a game seven in Madison Square Garden, you've made history. It's very, very difficult to do. The Pacers, for reference, yesterday ended up shooting 67% from the field. That is the highest field goal percentage for a standalone playoff game in NBA history and that was after they cooled off significantly in the for in second half rather 67 percent from the floor pretty darn fun and definitely not something we saw coming from the Indiana Pacers lastly let's wrap it up with the PGA championships they can't call Xander Shoffley the best golfer in the world without a major championship anymore the 30 year old from San Diego captured his first major victory yesterday by outlasting Live Golf League captain Bryson DeChambeau and Norway's Victor Hovland in the final round of the PGA Championship at Valhalla Golf Club in Louisville. After starting the day tied for the lead with a two-time major winner, Colin Morikawa, Shoffley silenced his critics who claimed he couldn't close out a big one by posting a 6-under 65 in the final round to finish a 72-hole uh, total of 21-under and defeat DeChambeau by one shot and got ahead of Hovland by three. And Shoffley recorded the lowest 72-hole score to par and the lowest 72-hole scoring total in a major championship. It was the ninth straight PGA Championship won by an American. Long overdue for Xander Shoffley. There's a lot of bright young stars on the PGA Tour and in Live Golf. Xander Shoffley, one of those, and he finally gets his major very well-deserved 21 under par and a historic 
victory for Shoffley. She DeChambeau pretty darn good. 20 under par. That was tied for the best score in a major ever. Outside of Shoffley, who bested it yesterday, 21 under par for the conclusion of the PGA Championship. We take the break. When we come back, it's your Monday history lesson on this day in sports history. Still to come, latest from the NFL. We'll break down the FCS preseason top 25 and get you all set up and good to go with the good, the bad, and the ugly to send you packing here on the Monday edition of Overtime. Stream us online, stream us on the app. Streaming now, Overtime with Burt Ramin on ESPN 102.3 and AM 1000 KSOO, Sioux Falls Sports Leader. Right back with you. It is the Monday edition of Overtime. Thanks so much for tuning us in, as always, right here on your Sioux Falls Sports Leader. Mondays are for a lot of things, but around here... It's time to get you folks educated on your sports history. It is time once again for On This Day in Sports History. History repeats itself. Down goes Frazier. Down goes Frazier. Well, sometimes. Yeah. What are they going to roll it? He caught it. Touchdown. <laughs> he did what? In the world of sports, there are moments that are fleeting. Ah! And some that live forever. Russell looks, throws inside. Oh, my God, it's picked off. Oh, he broke his ankles. Snap good, spot down. Walsh's kick is up, and it is no good. He missed it. Are you kidding me? It's time for Bert to deliver those moments that happened on this day in sports history. Little on this day in sports history. Yesterday will be remembered for a long time for Minnesota Timberwolves fans in their history. Biggest win, in my opinion, in franchise history occurred last night for the Minnesota Timberwolves. You got to go back to 1734. Today on this day in sports history, the first jockey club formed down in South Carolina, 1920, a little bit closer To the modern day and age, policemen raided the Chicago Cubs bleachers on this day. What for? They arrested 24 fans for gambling on this day in the bleachers, 1920 in Chicago. 1930 on this day in sports history, the University of California dedicated $1,500. That was a lot back then to research the prevention and cure for athletes' foot. Athlete? Sports, sports history. There you have it. 1930, 1972 on this day was the fifth championship for the ABA where the Indiana Pacers took down the New York Nets. Four games to two. 1984 on this day, Boston's Roger Clemens took down the Minnesota Twins. Final score, 5-4 in the game. That was Clemens' first career victory on this day in 1984. On this day in 1991, the best basketball player of all time, Chicago Bull great Michael Jordan was named the MVP of the NBA. And lastly, for on this day in sports history, from events uh, as far as they go, 1997, Chicago White Sox Frank Thomas reached base safely for the 15th straight game. Got a good amount of birthdays to share today on this day in sports history. It is a 1921 birthday for Hal Newhouser, the American Baseball Hall of Fame pitcher, seven-time All-Star, World Series champ in 1945, triple crown winner that same year with the Detroit Tigers, was born in Detroit, Michigan on this day in 1921, passed away in 1998. Vikings fans know him well. One of the best coaches in NFL history was born on this day in 1927. Bud Grant, American Pro Football Hall of Famer, Coach of the Year in 1969 with the Vikings and a four-time Grey Cup championship winning coach with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and basketball forward with the Minnesota Lakers as well. Born in Superior, Wisconsin on this day in 1927, Bud Grant passed away last year in 2023. 1940 birthday today for Canadian hockey great Stan Makita, Stanley Cup winner in 1961, was born in Sokolich, 
Slovak Republic. Hope I said that even remotely close to correct. Makita, born in 1940, passed away in 2018. Other birthdays today, 1971 birthday for American race car driver Tony Stewart. And a 39th birthday today, 1985 birthday for British road cyclist Chris Froome. Tour de France winner in 2013, 15, 16, 17. Several other big wins in his career. Chris Froome, the final birthday today on this day in sports history. Pretty quick history lesson today for you on a Monday. When we come back, it's time to get you the latest news from the National Football League. And I'm going to try to convince you, because I'm trying to convince me, to buy shares, buy stock in this young quarterback. It's not who you think. No way you're thinking the same guy I'm thinking of gearing up for 2024. Not a rookie, not a big-time playmaker, and might not be a guy that ends up even starting this season. But I'm trying to talk myself into this kid. I'll tell you who that is coming up next on Overtime. Don't miss a moment of pro sports action. Stay connected and download the app for Overtime on ESPN 102.3 and AM 1000 KSOO. Right back with you on the Monday edition of Overtime. Miss any of the show? No problem at all. Podcast links always available, ESPNSuFalls.com or on the free ESPN Sioux Falls app. Now time to talk football. Yes, we're in the middle of the offseason, but we got plenty of news and nuggets coming out from the UFL, college football, NFL, and in between over the weekend. Hero Sports, one of our favorite FCS publications, has put out their preseason top 25, and it's very favorable for the Dakotas, and it's very favorable for the Missouri Valley Football Conference. No doubt about it, South Dakota State is your top team in the preseason top 25 up there in Brookings. They manufacture greatness lately out there on the gridiron. SDSU top-ranked team, followed by North Dakota State at 2, Montana at 3, Montana State at 4, South Dakota in at number five in the preseason top 25, followed and rounded out in the top 10 by Villanova, Idaho, Sacramento State, Southern Illinois, and Chattanooga. Other notable teams in the top 25, Youngstown State from the MVFC at number 23, and Illinois State, the Redbirds check in at number 24. Other area teams in there, Eastern Illinois in the poll at number 25, and the receiving votes category, no local teams there, but Nichols State, Elon, and and UT Martin. More on that and that whole poll can be seen at Herosports.com. Well, playoff berth is in store for St. Louis professional football. The uh, Battle Hawks yesterday checked off that uh, off their list. And next up for St. Louis, they'll try to secure home field advantage for the XFL Conference Championship game. The Battle Hawks moved to 6-2 and two on the season on Sunday with a 26-21 win over the D.C. Defenders, and more than 32,000 people attended the game in St. Louis, proving yet again that it's still a football town and that the NFL should consider getting over the fact that it had to pay the St. Louis community $790 million for rampant lies told in connection with the relocation of the Rams. That's according and alleging to Pro Football Talk at NBCSports.com. The Battlehawks are coached by former NFL tight end Anthony Becht and won without Their starting quarterback, A.J. McCarron, former Green Bay Packer great Manny Wilkins, got the nod in McCarron's absence and won his first career start. St. Louis Battlehawks went toe-to-toe with the Birmingham Stallions a couple weeks ago. Yes, they lost the game, but they can play with Birmingham, who is the best team in the league right now. UFL postseason should be a lot of fun and just a couple weeks remaining in the regular season. Veteran running back Dalvin Cook is still looking for a future and a new home in the National Football League. He said back in early April that his tools are still there after spending most of last season on the bench for the Jets and the Ravens. But no team has yet been tempted enough by those tools to sign him to their roster for 2024. 
While no deal has come together, Cook has reportedly been in contact with clubs this offseason and said that he's been quote-unquote taking calls from teams while he works to make sure that he's in the right condition to make the most of any opportunity that comes his way. Just really focusing on myself, Cook said via Aaron Wilson of KPRC, getting ready for training camp, getting ready for what's coming next. There's a couple places that certainly make sense for Dalvin Cook. He could go in and be the elder statesman in an established backfield, or he could go and try to compete for a job. The one place that I'm hammering the table day in and day out for any veteran, rookie, Joe Blow, guy that's going to make the league, anyone out there that has a pulse to go play running back is Dallas. Duh. They need bodies in the running back room and they need guys that know how to run the football in the NFL. Dalvin Cook, how much does he have left in the tank? I don't know the answer to that question. The New York Jets marriage didn't work out. Brees Hall is a damn good running back. He didn't really crack the lineup because Brees was back and healthy and good to go. Then he goes to Baltimore. He had a little flash and pizzazz in the postseason, but that was a crowded backfield as well and and a team that isn't scared to trot out just about anyone to run the football there in Baltimore. Maybe Minnesota makes sense for a reunion with Dalvin Cook. It doesn't make too much sense because they got Aaron Jones and a couple other options But Minnesota still has a little bit of need in the backfield, at least I would think. Whether or not it's with Dalvin Cook remains to be seen. But Dalvin Cook reportedly taking calls, but patience is key, according to Pro Football Talk at NBCSports.com. Moving forward with your NFL news, Jim Otto, Pro Football Hall of Fame center, whose iconic number double zero jersey anchored the middle of the Raiders offensive line for 15 years passed away over the weekend at the age of 86. The Raiders, who moved from Oakland to Las Vegas back in 2020, announced his passing on Sunday night, calling him the original Raider. The cause of his death was not immediately known. Otto was a dominant center of his era, and many would argue any era, as he had a singular goal, never Will they kick my butt? The double zero of Otto, most uh, of the kicking in the 15-year career that never saw him miss a game from the AFL's initial season in 1960 through the 1970 AFL-NFL merger and his retirement following the 74 season. Otto, Jim Otto, started 210 straight regular season games, 223 including the playoffs, and was a pro bowler 12 times. Hall of Famer passed away over the weekend at the age of 86. Retirement uh, in the NFL over the weekend for running back David Johnson, former Missouri Valley standout at the University of Northern Iowa. He amassed over 6,800 rushing yards, 6,800 yards from scrimmage, and 58 touchdowns over eight years. Cardinals selected Johnson out of Northern Iowa in the third round back in 2015. Pretty impressive career for an FCS player. He is retired as of this weekend. Former All-Pro running back David Johnson. Majority of his career spent with the Arizona Cardinals. Now, lastly, I talked up a young quarterback going into break. Do I believe in him? I don't think so. Could I have my arm twisted to believe in him this year? Maybe. But the Oakland Raiders, the Las Vegas Raiders, of course, I'm now tripping over my words with the recent news. The Las Vegas Raiders have an interesting quarterback conundrum. They got Gardner Minshew, who is the most likable dude in the entire NFL. And I think that Minshew will beat out Aiden O'Connell in the preseason. But according to Pro Football Talk, the Raiders will begin their OTAs on Monday. And the ability to do full team drills on the field will give them a second chance or a chance to move forward with their starting quarterback competition. Aiden O'Connell finished last season as the team starter. And he'll have a slight leg up on free agent acquisition Gardner Minshew in the battle for this year's job. The Raiders were rumored to draft a quarterback. They did not draft anyone of substance there. So it's O'Connell and it's Gardner Minshew. Neither of those guys should be taken seriously as a top 10 quarterback in the NFL. I root for Gardner Minshew. I root for Minshew mania. I root for the facial hair and the, the headband and everything that comes with Gardner Minshew, no matter where he goes. So darn likable. But Aiden O'Connell last year, 62% completion percentage, 2,200 yards, 12 touchdowns to seven picks. That's not great. I understand that that is not great statistically. Fourth round pick last year, he was a rookie, and he didn't even appear in a game for the first three games, started game four, out game five and six, started game seven, out game eight, and then started the rest of the way. But if you're looking for a bright spot, and I'm talking to you Raider fans out there, if you're looking for me to slice and dice this to make you excited about Aiden O'Connell, it might be a little tough to do. But the one thing I'll say here, final four games of the regular season, the Raiders were three and one 
including a win over the Kansas City Chiefs on the road. The only game they lost in that stretch was to Gardner Minshew and the Colts, a three-point defeat. But Aiden O'Connell, last four games of the season, three and one, eight touchdowns, no picks, and a lot of significant growth down the stretch of the year. He wasn't highly touted, wasn't highly thought of as a top quarterback coming out last year. But Aiden O'Connell wouldn't surprise me. If he sees the field first ahead of Minshew, how long will he be there remains to be seen. The Raiders have a tremendously tough division. If they had time, really had time to sit with Aiden O'Connell, sit with Gardner Minshew and work on fundamentals and spend the time, I would think that Aiden O'Connell might be functional. The odds are stacked against him because he got some guy named Patrick Mahomes in the division and the Raiders have to win now. They got the players to win now, offense, defense, and otherwise. Aiden O'Connell, though, good, not great, down the stretch of last season. That's the latest from the National Football League. When we come back, we wrap up this Monday edition of the show with the good, the bad, and the ugly. Stay tuned. Keep it here. It's overtime on ESPN Sioux Falls. It's so convenient. Sports on the go. Download the free app now. This is ESPN 102.3 and AM 1000 KSOO, Sioux Falls Sports Leader. Ramin back here with you, putting the finishing touches on this Monday edition of Overtime. As always, we'll send you back in today with the good, the bad, and the ugly. Who's been the problem child today? Displayed their ugly side. Whined a bit too much and is now setting a bad example. Bird is calling out today's headline makers with the good, the bad, and the ugly. I really can't tell if this first one is good, bad, or ugly, but it certainly is something. Chiefs wide receiver Rashi Rice has been taking part in virtual meetings with the team during the early stages of their offseason program, but that is reportedly set to change as they kick off OTAs as of today. Adam Schefter of ESPN reports that Rashi Rice will attend the team's OTAs and that he's expected to participate in all activities. Rice is facing eight felony charges for his role in a March car crash down in Dallas, and police in the city also said that Rice is under investigation for an alleged assault that occurred earlier this month. That's the start, good, bad, or ugly, maybe all three, for Rashi Rice and the Kansas City Chiefs. Well, it's good to know your limitations, and that's what we're seeing right now for Nebraska. The proposed massive renovation of Nebraska's Memorial Stadium has been downsized for the time being, meaning the south end of the stadium won't be torn down after the season as originally planned. That's according to new athletic director Troy Dannon, who said this in a statement on Friday. Former athletic director Trev Alberts back in 2022 announced an estimated $450 million project to update the 100-year-old stadium, the first phase would have temporarily removed nearly 25,000 seats for the upcoming 2025 season, while a new south end zone section was to be built. Dannon's revised plan would address the east and west sides of the stadium, and work would begin no sooner than 2025. Bleacher seating would be replaced with chair backs in some, if not all, sections, and other amenities would be added as well. Renovations on the south end are in the long range plan, but there is no timetable. Get a load of this statement. I like this here. We are aligned on what the need is to modernize our aging stadium, but we have said any work we do needs to follow our guiding principles. First, it needs to help us win. Second, it needs to advance our goals for acquisition and retention of talent. And third, and most importantly, according to Dannon, it must preserve our financial stability. Don't get out over your skis. One of the greatest assets of Husker Athletics. That's a quote from Troy Dannon. That is good news for people to be so in control they can say, hey, let's wait a minute. Let's pump the brakes. Maybe this isn't for us right now or maybe this grand plan isn't for us. But you got to say at least they're guiding with principles in mind down 
in Lincoln, Nebraska. On to the bad. This is a weird situation and a weird start of a career for one of these surefire future uh, really great players in the National Football League. Fanatics, the company, has filed a lawsuit against Cardinals rookie wide receiver Marvin Harrison Jr. as of Saturday night in New York Supreme Court for breach of contract that the wide receiver signed with the retailer in May of 2023. In the suit, Fanatic said that Harrison has refused to fulfill his obligations to the deal while he also publicly asserted, that's a quote, that the contract does not exist. Details of what Harrison's contract with Fanatics required from the number four pick in the draft were redacted, as were the details of the financial agreement between the two. However, a source told ESPN earlier this month that the deal was for at least $1 million and that the contract was for autographs, signed trading cards, game-worn apparel, and other marketing opportunities. So far in his young career, I'll say this as nicely as I can, Marvin Harrison Jr., Ruffling some feathers, a little bit of a different cat as he missed the media availability at the Combine. Strange start to the career for one of the future really great players to come out of this 2024 NFL draft class. Lastly here, as the ugly uh, continues to rear its ugly head, gambling and otherwise, according to a poll here, one in three high-profile athletes receive abusive messages from individuals with a betting interest. According to ESPN.com, and more than 540 men's and women's college basketball players received similar abuse, including death threats during championship tournaments in March. That's according to the NCAA in a release on Friday. Get your act together, people. And for you athletes out there, my only advice is log off. Delete the social media and focus on your game. You don't deserve that. No one does. That's the good, the bad, the ugly. That's the show on a Monday. Have a great day, Sioux Falls. We'll do it tomorrow at 11. Next edition of Overtime coming up then right here on ESPN Sioux Falls.